Good, well done. Wonderful. No point in my saying anything, you see, because it's always so fascinating watching somebody fiddle with a camera. <laughs> so you've been all, all enjoyed that, as have I. So now we can begin. 400 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus, a very remarkable king came to the throne of Macedonia, which is part of Greece. His name was Philip, and he had a very famous, he had a very famous son, of whom you will have heard. Alexander the Great. And uh, Philip established a city and he called it Philippi. And you know Philippi very well because it figures prominently in the New Testament, not only in the passage that we've read from the book of Acts chapter 16, but also, and perhaps even more significantly, there is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And that's what gives it its fame. And I want to talk about that church for a moment because I think we need to be encouraged knowing that the Lord has intentions for this church. And you may sometimes think, oh goodness me, you know, things have changed here. We're not as numerous as we were and it's all a bit discouraging, isn't it? Well, I want to encourage you this morning because we are the church of Jesus Christ. And he has immense plans for all of us, collectively, as well as individually. And so I want to pick up in Acts chapter 16, because this is the second apostolic adventure of the Apostle Paul. He was a, a man who loved adventure, and he certainly had some pretty hairy ones at times. He was beaten up on a number of occasions. He was rejected left, right, and center. Oh, he had a tough time of it. But he was not daunted. Why? Because he was a man of the mission. He had a gospel to proclaim. And his gospel was very straightforward. And his gospel was very clear. And he tells us about it in the first letter he wrote to the church of Corinth. In chapter 1 and verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, he writes this speaking about his visit to the church at Corinth, or rather to the town, the city of Corinth. When I came to you, my brothers, I wanted to know just one thing while I was with you. Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear. Why was that? Well, because Corinth was such a terrible place. Corinth was a byword for evil in those days. In fact, if you lived a debauched life, you were said to Corinthianize, which gives you the idea of what that city was like. It was so filled with evil that people shook in their shoes if they were godly and they came to Corinth. And Paul describes his coming to Corinth in exactly those terms. But although he was surrounded by so much evil, I wanted to know just one thing while I was with you, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that was his core message wherever he went, not least when he came to <coughs> Philippi. And we heard the first part of that remarkable account read for us, and my goodness, I did give you a tough old reading, didn't I? <laughs> my word, you suffered there and you did jolly well. But those place names, I think they defeat most people unless they were familiar with them. But what they describe is something astonishing. They describe the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but guidance in such an extraordinary way that some people might see it as very negative. What do I mean? Well, let me just repeat some of it. Paul and, this is chapter 16 of Acts and verse six. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept <coughs> by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now that's incredible to me, that the Holy Spirit stopped Paul from taking the gospel into the Roman province of Asia, which included places like Ephesus, incredibly important cities. But the Holy Spirit stopped him. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. 
So here we have a succession of attempts to go and preach the gospel, and yet the Holy Spirit stopped him. And you may find that difficult to accept, but it's clearly stated by the writer of this great book, who is Dr. Luke, as you probably know. So he, he makes no mistakes, he's a careful workman, and so every word is precise as far as Luke is concerned. So this is what happened, and the Holy Spirit, no. Now that's a tough one to take. Why would the Holy Spirit say no? Well, because he had another purpose for Paul. He didn't want him at this stage to preach in those places. Oh, he would eventually, but it wasn't for now. And to have a sense of the Lord's timing is so incredibly important for God's people, isn't it? To know when he wants me to do certain things and how. He's good at telling me those things, but I need to have my ears wide open and not to assume it's particularly true for someone like myself who's a preacher because sometimes I can prepare a sermon and can stand up in front of the people and even start delivering it and then suddenly the Holy Spirit will say no Chris, not for now I want you to say something else and when that happens it can be very disconcerting because you can think, oh no where am I? I'm lost. No, you're not. You've been found, preacher. You've been found, and you're going to go deliver the message I want you to deliver. And I have experienced that from time to time. I never get used to the idea, but it happens, and I'm glad it happens, because when it does, it usually means the Lord is giving me something very particular for the dear people that I'm addressing. But here in this instance, Paul was frustrated twice. Why? Well, because they passed by Mysia, verse 8, and went down to Troas. Now, clearly, that had not been on Paul's itinerary. It wasn't one of his intended preaching opportunities. But it was God's. He came down to Troas, a little place by the seaside. But there, something remarkable happened. He met a person who was to have a profound impact in his life. This guy was Dr. Luke, the guy who wrote the Acts of Apostles and also the Gospel that bears his name. Notice very carefully what we read here. During the night, Paul had a vision, this is verse 9, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, what's the next word? We. we. What does that tell you? It tells you that the person who's writing this suddenly joins Paul's party at this point. Now you understand why the Holy Spirit nudged Paul down to Troas rather than to Asia or Bithynia. It wasn't time for those places. And Paul hadn't reckoned on going to Troas, but circumstances forced him into it. This is the Holy Spirit at work. This is remarkable. And so Luke joins Paul at this point. And what a significant ministry he had as someone who wrote about Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, and someone who wrote about the early church and in particular, Paul himself. Now why did he do that? He did it because God gifted him for it and God called him to do it. And he wrote to a particular person. If you're familiar with the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, you'll know that they're both addressed to the same individual. Anybody know his name? Theophilus. Who? Theophilus. Theophilus. Good, yeah. Theophilus. And some scholars, and I think they're probably right, believe that Theophilus was a Roman lawyer who was engaged by the early church to defend the Apostle Paul when he was on trial for his life in Rome. And that would occur after the book of Acts was completed. Paul was under house arrest in Rome right at the end. And we believe that he was defended in a Roman court by this man Theophilus, 
and that he was successful in getting Paul off the charges which the Jews had brought against him. So it's all very fascinating when you look at the historical reality of these things. This was true. This was lived. All these experiences are genuine experiences. And we can be amazed at the fortitude of the Apostle Paul. But how wonderful that the Lord provided him with great friends who could support his ministry. After Paul had seen the vision, verse 10, we, there it is again, got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so they come to this place, Troas, and then they move to this place, Philippi. They travel by sea and they arrive there, and then in verse 13, we're given some further details. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. How extraordinary. You wouldn't expect to find a place of prayer down by the Thames at Walton Bridge, would you? Um, that's not our culture, you see. This is first century Jewish culture. And first century Jewish culture dictated that if you wanted to establish a synagogue in a town, you had to have ten Jewish men living there. Now if you couldn't find ten Jewish men, you had to content yourself with a place of prayer. And a favorite place for a place of prayer was down by a river where there was flowing water. And this is a case in point. So that tells us that Philippi was a thoroughly Gentile city with only a smattering of Jews living there. But that's where Paul headed for. We went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. Notice the reference to her household. Now that doesn't tell us that these were a family including babies. And some people suggest that that is what it means. And so when there's a reference here to them being baptized, it must mean that they baptized babies as well. But the word doesn't mean that. The word doesn't mean family. It means all the people living in a particular house. And this woman, Lydia, was a businesswoman. So she had servants, she had workers with her. That was the household referred to. They all heard the gospel and they became Christians and were baptized. Hallelujah. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So the first convert in Paul's ministry on the continent of Europe was a businesswoman, a Jewish businesswoman. How fascinating. She was the founder member of the church in Philippi. Isn't that extraordinary? But then it goes on, and you know what happened. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, a clairvoyant spirit. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? What a testimony. Imagine that. Her shouting like this as they were traveling through the streets of Philippi. She kept it up for many days. Finally, says Luke, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. What an extraordinary thing. This woman running, coming down the street and calling out in this demonic, prophetic way, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. 
Now what's wrong with that statement? Nothing. Nothing at all. It's a wonderful thing. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. But was it a message from God? Although it was right? Answer? No, it jolly well wasn't. How do we know? Well, it took a few days for Paul to be aware of it because it says she kept this up for many days. Finally, notice Paul hadn't intervened at this point, but finally Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. You see, that's what you call discerning of spirits. And it didn't happen instantaneously, did it? You notice what Luke says. She kept this up for many days. Paul wasn't troubled. Finally, Paul was troubled. Now, it's very interesting sometimes how you can encounter people who appear to bring you the word of the Lord. You have to be very, very careful when somebody says, I have a word from God for you. Well and good if it's correct, but very dangerous if it's not. Now, Paul had that deep understanding. He sensed, he was aware when the Holy Spirit was moving, and he was equally aware when the Holy Spirit was not. And this awareness gradually increased until he got to the point where he turned on this girl and he addressed the demon that was in her. Now that's a remarkable thing and this is part of the ministry of the church. Confronting the forces of evil, challenging them in the name of Jesus. Marvelous, isn't it, when a church is functioning at that level. And why not? When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now you can understand their rage, can't you? Suddenly, this lovely little wage earner, wages for them, slavery for her, was taken away by this wretched preacher. And so they arrested him. Now notice verse 21, by advocating customs unlawful for us, Romans to accept or practice. Now it was in Greece, it wasn't in Italy. <coughs> But Philippi was a town which had served the Romans very well. And the Romans gave Philippi a special level of status. They called it the Italic Rite, R-I-G-H-T, which meant that if you lived in Philippi, you had exactly the same rights as somebody living in the city of Rome. It was an amazing privilege. We don't know how they earned it, but they had done somehow or other. But you see how they cherished their status. Unlawful for us Romans. Now they weren't Romans, they were from Philippi. But they had that status. So it was an important place. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten after they'd been severely flogged. They were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Why? Because Paul had brought deliverance to that poor slave girl. Now we're not told what happened to her, but I don't think Paul was a man who did half a job, do you? I cannot for the life of me imagine that the Lord would have used him to cast out a demon from that poor girl and to leave her in that wretched state. Delivered from a demon, but left in utter penury because she was no longer of any use to her owners. I reckon that she was enveloped in Lydia's love. 
and she became the second member of the church in Philippi. What an extraordinary possibility that is. I think it's likely though, because Paul wouldn't leave a job half done. And so we have the founder members of this great church in Philippi, which was to become so important in Paul's life that when he wrote to it, he had not a single thing to criticize. It was love and joy and fellowship. That's what he wrote about, because that's what this church was known for. But its origin was so unpromising. Who was the third member of the church in Philippi? Well, we're just introduced to him now. About midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Imagine that. In a prison, in a Roman jail. Not very nice in a Roman jail. But they were praying and singing hymns to God. Isn't it wonderful how our eternal hope can burn so bright that we're not cowed by our circumstances? It's interesting how some people think that Christians are somehow above normal living. And you say to a Christian, how are you? And if he's clever, he may say something like, oh, I'm fine, thank you, above the circumstances. Above the circumstances? Sounds pious, but it's rot, isn't it? How can you live above your circumstances? It's true that we're not to live under our circumstances, so what are we to live? We're to live through them. The Lord Jesus lived through his circumstances. He was the Son of God, is the Son of God. And he lived through all his circumstances, walking with his Father. And that is the Christian's walk. It's typified, if you will, in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures, as we should properly call them, and in Psalm 23, remember Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of deepest darkness, even death itself, I won't be afraid. Why not? You are with me. Now notice where the sheep is walking. It's not walking on the cliffs above the valley, the deep gorge. He's going through the valley, but going through it with the shepherd, who is constantly tapping out the way on the side of the gorge with his staff, tap, 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 and his voice reassuring the sheep. But they're going through it, but the shepherd is going through the valley with the sheep. And that's how it is for us. Yes, of course we confront difficult circumstances, and we go through them because the Lord is going through them with us. How reassuring that is. Praise the Lord. And so here they are, filled with hope, filled with joy, but in a dark, cold dungeon, in an alien town. They were singing. They were praying. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Just imagine that. They'd never heard such a thing before. Cursing and swearing and complaining. That's what they normally heard in a prison, but not this time. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He thought the prisoners had escaped. You see, if that had happened, he was a dead man. The Romans would have tortured him to death because he had failed the emperor. And so he thought to kill himself to avoid torture. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for knights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. You see that? They all heard the word of the Lord. 
They became Christians on the basis of having had the gospel shared with them. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God. He and his whole family, they'd all heard the gospel. They'd all responded to the gospel. They'd all been baptized. Hallelujah. And Paul would have prayed for them. And here they are. A Christian household. How wonderful. So here was the third member of the church in Philippi. Another extraordinary candidate. A Roman jailer. <coughs> they don't come any harder than that. As tough as old boots. And he'd seen it all. Because they gave jobs like this to Roman soldiers who'd served well in the legions. He'd seen it all. Wenching and drenching the towns that they came to. Oh yes, wherever the Romans went, there was chaos. And so here was a man who was as hard as nails. Here we have a, a Jewish businesswoman. Here we have a converted slave girl and a Roman jailer. Now that's a pretty unlikely foundation for a church, don't you think? And you look at one another and you think, well, we're not as young as we were, some of us. What can the Lord do with us? We've got a history. We've got a present. But have we got a future? But when you reason like that, you reason without the Holy Spirit, that's for sure. I can tell you, our Heavenly Father, our glorious Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our one God, is trembling with anticipation and excitement for you. You are born again. You've received God's Spirit. Most of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You understand what the spiritual gifts are. You exercise spiritual gifts. You're open to the Lord to lead you into situations where you can touch people's lives and bless them by bringing them the gospel and by bringing them healing and deliverance and the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge to crack open their lives. They're so sad, aren't they? They're so hopeless. Hope. The great theme of today, the first sun, 